Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Edible Education 101, the 2020 edition. Tonight's our third class meeting. It's so much fun and to feel the energy in this room. It's like a refuge from the chaos of the outside world. So I really appreciate that. It's just um, it's, it's rejuvenating and inspiring and hopeful in here. And we're glad you're all here tonight to learn more about the food system and the ways we can make a positive um, impact on it. I brought you today an image from my little greenhouse. It's been pretty cold in the morning, so these are uh, cuttings that I made from a plant called a pelargonium. Pelargonium is also known as a scented geranium, and they're just um, remarkable in how aromatic they are. Some smell like a rose. They almost smell like you know that kind of uh, cold cream or soapy rose, and some smell like ginger, and others smell like lemon and grapefruit. They're, they're quite remarkable. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to have a very, um, really exciting topic, an emerging area of interest and of particular relevance to food systems innovation, regenerative agriculture. And we just have an amazing stellar panel of researchers and practitioners. And we're going to have, I, I'm just really looking forward to the conversation tonight. So that's just ahead. A couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, one is I'd really appreciate it if you'd put your laptop away now so that you can give your full attention to the guests. Second, we have an extra credit assignment that you are welcome to participate in, which is due at 11.59 tonight. We put 11.59 specifically because we use B courses. And if you try 12, you won't be able to submit the um, the paper. So don't even wait till the last minute. But just to refresh your memory, this is all in the syllabus, but the extra credit is your opportunity to recommend a topic and a speaker or more that you think would be really relevant to the next edition of Edible Ed, or even perhaps participate in one of our later classes where we're going to focus on specific innovators. So if you have something to contribute, please turn it in. Also, your second reflection is due ten, uh, Friday night at 11.59. And to get full credit for your reflection, I just want to encourage you to remember to um, make sure you reference the readings and the lectures that you've been participating in, as well as the prompts and questions. The purpose of the reflection is for you to make these connections and to um, start to show that you're understanding the relationships between the disparate pieces of information. So don't just give us your view or your opinion. Um, link it to what you're learning in the class, OK? You know, tonight, I wanted to continue with, with my contribution to you is to share a little bit of the way entrepreneurs put ideas into practice. And I wanted to introduce the ideas of mindset, skill sets, and tool sets to you. And I'm going to revisit these during the semester. But some of the ideas that I'm going to share with you tonight may be beneficial for your reflection this week. So you'll remember um, how powerful the, um, the lexicon, the words we use to shape our view of, a, of an idea or a concept. I, I'm struck by um, what Kathleen Merrigan gave us last week, where she said, um, think of, instead of calling it food waste, let's think of it as wasted food. And she used this example, you know, if I'm cooking dinner for you and I'm saying, this dinner is just prepared from food waste, that might not as be as appetizing as I've just taken all this wasted food and put together this magnificent meal for you. So that little nuance, uh, rhetorical nuance, can be really powerful as a frame in getting people to adopt a new idea or a new relationship to an idea. Similarly, I have shared with you my personal penchant for using the word eater as opposed to consumer. 
And every food company that I come in contact with, I remind them that using the word consumer is pretty dehumanizing. And when you think about it, the result may contribute to just the um, problems that we have with diabetes and obesity and people overeating. If you just think of someone as a consumer, you're um, just thinking of them as an object <laughs> and not a human being who has uh, a life and a, a desire to flourish in health and well-being. And remember, Kathleen also shared with us this idea of the mindset of solutions rather than problems. So entrepreneurs actually cultivate mindsets that are optimistic, that are growth-oriented. Growth meaning learning. How quickly can we learn? And mindsets are something that can be practiced. We've actually got a center here on campus in UC Berkeley called the Greater Good Science Center. And they do a lot of research in behavioral science and neuroscience about how we can effectively cultivate mindsets that are going to lead toward more solution-oriented um, outcomes and practices. And this is just more important than ever that we take these disciplines and these technologies seriously because we're living in a time of overwhelm, of um, rampant you know, hopelessness, disenfranchisement, polarization. And so part of what we're trying to learn in this class, in addition to appreciating the state of science, um, appreciating the interdependence of a lot of different disciplines, is actually to cultivate mindsets that are solution-oriented. Um, to that end, Kathleen also reminded us that one of the best ways to put our values into action is to actually vote. Voting is coming up in, on March 3rd, just a little under a month in California. Um, you can still get registered online to vote in California. If you want to vote in your home state, you still have time to request an absentee ballot. Um, Independents need to choose their party affiliation by February 18th. This is just a friendly reminder that you can voice your perspective and your values at the polling place, OK? So one of the skill sets that um, we can practice and refine is the art of visioning. Visioning is using our uh, imagination and our mental facility to create a picture of something in the future that we believe and uh, want to bring to fruition. And there's lots of different kinds of practices around this, but entrepreneurs who are really skilled at visioning can paint the picture of something that doesn't exist yet. Remember, Alice gave us a vision for um, a healthy school lunch sourced from local farmers for every child in California. That's a vision. And in your reflection this week, we're going to ask you to envision the kind of agricultural system that you desire for yourself as you uh, grow and mature, and perhaps your offspring. We'll talk more about that. I also want to introduce a tool set that's um, very relevant for managing the difference between a vision and where we are today, which we'd often call a current reality. If you're going to be the leader of a movement, of an enterprise, of any kind of change or transition, you need to be able to manage creative tension. And as you're going to see throughout the semester, in food, and the food system in particular, we're moving from one state, which is uh, in some cases you might call broken or uh, not ideal or um, to something that is better. So learning how to manage the transition from where we are now to where we want to go is also the art of managing creative tension. I like to use this rubber band as an example. Um, entrepreneurial leaders will create a vision that is connected to the current reality or the present moment. And they learn how to kind of mediate the amount of tension between 
where we want to go and where we are. Now, entrepreneurs, if you've ever worked with one, they tend to have a capacity to hold enormous um, stress or tension between where they're going and where we are now. Um, but a good leader is always keeping track of sort of where people are and showing how to keep the team or the organization together in this process of transition, moving from one state to another. So um, people bring different levels of commitment, belief, ability to suspend their temporary judgment about um, how bad things are right now and how good they might be. But I want to just introduce you to this creative tension model. And I'm going to kind of bring it up a couple other times during the semester. You can also look it up online. There's quite a bit written uh, about it. Now, one of the goals of the course is for you to develop food systems intelligence. This is how everything is connected and interdependent. And we're going to be learning how and where to intervene in a system to change the food system. Um, you've seen this graphic before of a healthy food system. You're also going to start hearing the terms food value chain or supply chain. These are more linear, um, sequential ways of kind of illustrating the relationships between inputs and activities and processing distribution throughout the, um, the food system. Tonight, we're going to be focusing very much at the beginning of this food value chain in the, in the soil. I also just want to bring to your attention, and for those of you that are um, auditing the class or maybe not doing the readings, one of the voices of intelligence and wisdom that we bring into this class is that of Danella Meadows, who is one of the foremost um, innovators in the world of systems thinking and systems dynamics, just a, a beautiful writer. And she um, expressed that getting to know a system is a lot like getting involved in a dance. Um, it can become a very like heady, um, intellectual, complicated idea. But she introduced this idea that getting to know a system is like a dance. And learning where our actions, our interventions, whether they're conscious or unconscious, are impacting the outcomes in the system is something that she has um, brought really to the, to the fold. And I just wanted to highlight a couple tonight that I think are particularly relevant given, given our topic. Get the beat. Expose your mental models to the open air. That means open your mind. Become aware that we actually all bring a mental model to our perception. Expand thought horizons and then celebrate complexity. Certainly tonight we will be getting into a, a new level of complexity. We've also asked you to look at the drawdown work. This is some of the, I think, so, some of the most powerful and accessible research. And one of the things that's so powerful about the drawdown work is showing that the food sector is the foremost area for intervention in drawing down CO2 and carbon levels that we, that we have accessible to us. And this whole world of regenerative farming, carbon farming, is, is right before us. So this image, um, if you haven't looked at the drawdown book, is just contextual to show all of the kind of itemized opportunities there are for us human beings on this planet to intervene in our global, you know, our planetary system with new choices and new technologies and new practices um, that have an impact. And, and soil and regenerative agriculture are sort of number three and four or five on this list. So it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce to you a guest curator for our uh, course tonight. Um, I'm delighted that Tiffany Patton is here. Tiffany is on the team at Real Food Media, which is led by one of my heroes and colleagues, Anna LaPay. And Tiffany is a, I would call her an emergent and important voice in, uh, in the food movement. And it was her kind of initiative and inertia to create 
uh, tonight's course for you. Tiffany looks after kind of storytelling and narrative, but she, she, her background is so interesting. She um, has master's degrees in both business and public administration. So she's a perfect example of the kind of person that's working cross-disciplinarily, you know, and connecting groups of people who usually practice in pretty siloed areas. Um, so I'm going to let Tiffany introduce uh, the rest of our guests tonight and frame our topic. Let's have a warm welcome for Tiffany Patton. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I don't know if you have heard like how some industry leaders will pick like a trend of the year. So like Pantone, for example, they pick a color of the year. And this year, it's classic blue. Um, Webster's Dictionary picked a word of the year last year, and it was they. I feel like if the food and farming community would pick a word, our word of the year would be regenerative. I hear it all the time. It's like filled with so much excitement and buzz. But what does it really mean? Um, so if any of you have been getting the Edible Ed emails or read the class syllabus, which you should, probably should have if you're taking the class, um, the definition is in there. And regenerative agriculture is um, a system of farming methods and principles that does four things, really. It increases biodiversity, it enriches soil, it improves watersheds, and it enhances the natural like ecosystem services. And we're going to really zero in first on the part about enriching soils. So when the soil is healthy, that's great, right? Like things can grow better, it can absorb more water. But what's really exciting now is that we've discovered that soil can also draw carbon down from the sky and, like, and bring it into the ground. And so today we're going to talk about that, and we're also going to talk about regenerative agriculture in general. So the day, today's class is going to be split into three portions. First, it's going to be a conversation with me and Dr. Wendy Silver, and she's going to explain the science behind soil carbon sequestration. And then we're going to bring up some practitioners, Lauren Panja, Marita Brown, Kristen Leach, two farmers and a rancher. And we're going to see what it looks like to actually practice regenerative agriculture and also what values really drive them in their work and how it shows up in their work. Yeah. So great. Dr. Wendy Silver, if you would come up and join me. So Dr. Wendy Silver is the Rudy Grau Chair and Professor of Ecosystem Ecology and Biogeochemistry at UC Berkeley. You're also the lead scientist of the Marin Carbon Project, and you were recently named a Climate Action Champion at UC Berkeley. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being with us and sharing some of your knowledge. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> so first, I'd love to know... Um, what drove you from being a scientist to being a scientist and a climate action champion? So, so that's a that's a great question. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't um, set out to be a climate action champion. I mean, I run and I like to lift weights, but <laughs> I didn't think that that would you know qualify me to be a climate action champion. But but what really got me motivated, and I'll show a, a couple of slides. Let's see if I can get this to go. Whoops. Oh, back one. Ugh, it's not showing up. Um, well, I'll just tell you about it then. For some reason, the slide's not showing. Um, a, a couple of years ago, a report came out. I mean, we've been working on, on trying to understand the impacts of climate change and trying to slow climate change for more than a decade. And it all kind of came together for me when this report was released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that's a group of scientists from countries all over the world um, that get together and try to write a consensus report. And if any of you have any friends or colleagues that are scientists, you'll know that getting us to agree on something is really, really, really hard. And so these consensus reports are, are important. What they're doing is summarizing the state of science on a topic, and in this case, the state of science on climate change. Um, and they're, they're, to be honest, they're conservative. They're kind of watered down. And, and that's because it's, it's so hard to get people to agree on the wording. Mm -hmm. And this report that came out um, recently, um, and I'll just read this quote from it, said, all pathways that limit, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is too much, right? We already know that 1.5 degrees Celsius is going to result in a lot of changes that, that are going to be 
hard for us to take. So all pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with little or no overshoot project the use of carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2 over the 21st century. A gigaton is 10 to the 15th grams of carbon. It's a lot of carbon. What that's saying is emissions reduction is no longer sufficient to solve the climate change problem. We have to remove CO2 out of the atmosphere in addition to, to um, reducing emissions. So that's what got me motivated, was that, that need to um, somehow think about not just lowering emissions, but also removing carbon dioxide, and then saying, well, what could I do as an ecologist and a biogeochemist that might help us move towards those solutions? Awesome, thank you. So last, I've, I don't read all of the IPCC reports because I am not a scientist, um, but it's pretty, pretty dense stuff. But last year I read uh, a briefing on, on the one on land management and climate, and they were talking about how basically land is such a critical resource and how we manage the land is super vital to that. And so poor land management, um, which you see a lot with industrial agriculture, um, fuels a lot of land degradation and deforestation, and that contributes so much to greenhouse gas emissions. But if we manage the land better, we can not only, as you were saying, not only reduce how much we emit, but also um, take it out. And so can you tell us a little bit about the Marin Carbon Project first, actually? Sure. And who's working on that? Yeah, so, so the Marin Carbon Project was a, and, and this is a, a great story, because I think it just shows the power of people. Um, it's a, it was just a group of us. It, it was um, uh, a rancher from Marin and um, the guy he had hired as a, his ranch consultant who happened to have a PhD in range management, um, and, but had been working, uh, m most of his job was working on an olive farm and the rest of the time he went and consulted um, on, on ranches. And um, they ha had um, seen a news report on the fact that climate change was going to drive a lot of changes in agriculture that were going to be detrimental to the food production system. And they wondered if there was anything that they could do um, on their lands to help um, s solve this problem, to help slow climate change. And so through a very odd set of um, coincidences, really, they ended up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab meeting with a colleague of mine on a completely different question and had said, hey, do you know any scientists that work on soils and carbon? <laughs> and my colleague said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. He called me up. And I went up to meet these folks up at the lab, and they said, you know, what about soil? Is there anything we could do with our soil? And I said, well, that's a really good question. We don't really know. Right? We hadn't done that research uh, as, a, as a scientific community. We hadn't really determined, first, could we detect a change in soil carbon? And secondly, could we change management to really suck carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into soils? And so we started talking um, about what would it take and what would be the, the different steps we would need to take to try to understand whether or not this would be something that we could do. And over the course of maybe a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, we started inviting other people to our conversations, um, a local agricultural land trust, because they had access to all the ranchers in the area and all the different practices that they were doing. They helped put together, together with UC Extension, a meeting of, with me and, and the ranchers um, that, Lauren, I don't know if you were at that meeting, but it was at the, bar the Red Barn and I got up as a scientist and started saying, science, 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 science. And everybody in the audience was like, oh. <laughs> and then finally I said, well, what do you think might work? And this is how we got onto this, this research, as people started to say, well, I've tried this practice. I'm trying that practice. And they were noticing changes in their land. Mm -hmm. And so there was no science behind it at that point, no organized science behind it at that point, and that's, that's where we came in. The, the project grew, mm -hmm. and um, now we're still going. We're still looking for ways in which we can increase carbon storage in soils. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful coincidence that, that happened to all take place. Um, so you found that soil carbon sequestration does work, so can you tell us a little bit about that sci the science behind it so sure. we can understand? So let's see if we can get these slides to work. So this is how it works. Um, this is the distribution of carbon between the atmosphere, the vegetation, and the soils. 
Um, the, the atmosphere holds about 760 petagrams. So that's just another word for gigaton, that, that 10 to the 15th grams. Um, the vegetation holds a little less, about 610 petagrams. And the soil has tremendous potential to hold, soil, hold carbon. Um, the average number that people um, cite is about 2,000 petagrams. But the reality is we don't really know because it's a big brown box that you know, we haven't opened so much. Um, it's hard to measure really accurately at a global scale how much carbon can be stored. So I've seen numbers up to 3,500 petagrams. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can see that there's more carbon storage potential in the soil mm -hmm. than what we have in the atmosphere today. Um, oh boy, I don't know what's happening with my slides. But um, the... Uh, there are reasons why you would want to put carbon in soils, and, and that's because there's a lot of co-benefits mm -hmm. to increasing soil carbon, and that's because the mechanism to transport um, carbon from plants in the atmosphere into soils is organic matter. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who gardens and, and anybody who farms or ranches knows that if you improve the organic matter content of your soil, you're likely to improve the water holding capacity of your soil, the, the fertility of your soil, and thus the sustainability and, and productivity of your soil, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. that's so important now as we're facing like this time of increasing like disasters and all these shocks and stresses from our warming climate. We need to have like that resiliency built into the soil. That's yeah, great. right, right. So organic matter plays a really important role, and organic matter is deliv delivering carbon, mm -hmm. right? Uh, carbon is a big, um, important part of organic material. So. We've been working in, in grasslands, and there's several reasons why we've chosen grasslands, and that's because grasslands tend to occur in places where there's um, drought during part of the year, and any time you get ecosystems that experience drought during part of the year, like a dry season, the plants over evolutionary time have figured out that if they put a lot of their energy and their organic material, and hence their carbon, mm -hmm. below ground to roots, they can look for water and nutrients, and they can survive these, these dry periods. Mm. So healthy grasslands, healthy soils in grasslands tend to be organic-rich grasslands. Awesome. Grasslands are also really geographically expansive. They cover about a third of the global land surface mm. and over 40% of California. Wow. Right? So they play a really important role. And then just one other important reason to do this is that, like many agricultural lands, grassland, the majority of grasslands globally are degraded with right. regard to carbon. So you were talking about land use and how land use can, not always, but can degrade soils. And one of the ways that those soils become degraded is by losing their carbon stock. Mm -hmm. um, the soils, the, the microbes in soils can utilize that carbon as an energy source. They breathe it essentially back to the atmosphere. That's a natural process. But if we don't manage it carefully, too much of that carbon gets lost. And what this graph is showing is that over 12,000 years, we've lost a lot of carbon out of our working lands, our agricultural soils, both croplands and grasslands. Grasslands have actually lost more mm -hmm. than croplands, and that it's all mostly happening in the last few hundred years. Right. Right? So these systems are degraded with regard to carbon. And that means that maybe through management, we could put some of that back. Mm -hmm. I don't expect you to have the answer for this, but I wonder what would happen. You said it's like 40% of the world is carbon in grasslands? 30% 30 of the, yeah, So if launching. all of that was like healthy grassland, like I wonder how much carbon we could draw down. That would be, yeah. I can, I can answer that. Oh, you that. can answer that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, we have, we have an estimate. Mm -hmm. um, we, there are several estimates that are out there. And again, they're, they're all estimates. They're based on models and the best available data. Mm -hmm. um, and then the number is not maybe as relevant as what that can do to climate. Um, we have estimates that if we were to improve management on rangeland and cropland, using the techniques we already know how to do mm -hmm. that have already been applied widely at a global mm -hmm. scale, so not new techniques like some of the stuff we're doing that Lauren's doing, the compost applications, but, but other techniques, we could potentially lower global temperatures by 0.1 to 0.3 degrees Celsius wow. by the end of the century. So that's not going to solve climate change. It's, it's not a, a silver bullet, mm -hmm. per se, but it should definitely be part of the portfolio of things that we do because not only are you helping slow climate change, you're also improving 
the productivity and sustainability of our working land. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So where does compost come into all of this? Good question. <laughs> yeah, how did I get work how did I get started working on compost, right? <laughs> um, um, let's see if I've got this. Yeah. So we, um, as I said, we, we, we started by talking with farmers and ranchers and mm -hmm. this and this colleague, this, this range manager who is really a local um, compost guru. He was just very into <laughs> compost. And I would have I would have science arguments with him because he said we really should be applying compost. And I said, no, no, that's gonna result in lots of greenhouse gas emissions. And mm. he said, no, 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 we should try it. And when we had this meeting with farmers and ranchers, they said a couple of them said, hey, you know, we've been composting chicken waste, we've been composting um, other materials that we can get cheaper for free, and putting that on our lands, it seems to be, seems like those sites are more productive. Mm -hmm. You know, can you study that? Mm -hmm. And so we, um, oh, oh, I really apologize for this. What, what we did was we um, started out by, by looking at soils all over Marin and Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. They were close. A lot of wonderful working lands. We had great contacts there. Um, we sampled 35 fields um, from 22 ranches, over a thousand soil samples, and what we found were these two bars. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so the the big bar, um, the big bar is soils that have been intensively managed, mm -hmm. and the little bar were the soils that were managed extensively, and. Um, I did, we did the study blind. So we went and sampled all the sites, everything was coded, mm -hmm. and our colleagues at um, the Land Trust and UC Extension kept all the information to themselves about what was going on. And that was important because we really wanted to, not that we could have biased our results, but we really wanted to just do it, do, you know, do it completely blind and see how it would come out. Yeah. So I gave the presentation to everybody and I said, something's wrong though, because these sites were called intensive and they have more carbon. And I don't see how you could intensively manage something and have more carbon. And they're all laughing, you know, because it's like, here's the dumb professor who, who doesn't get it. The, the intensively managed sites were dairies and they were mm. applying cattle manure. Mm. Um, and cattle manure resulted in big carbon sequestration um, in soils. But cattle manure also has a problem in that it is a big source of nitrous oxide, which is a super, super potent greenhouse gas, yeah. right? So we knew that wasn't going to work. Um, so we needed to um, look at another approach, and that's where we kind of really embodied this composting idea mm -hmm. and saying, well, if we take that manure that's really high emitting um, one of the drivers of climate change, we put it into a compost pile in a compost system. We measure all the greenhouse gases because that's what we do. We love, love, love equipment <laughs> and things like that. And then go apply that onto the landscape, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got into compost, was, was trying to figure out a way to take all that nutrient-rich, carbon-rich organic material that um, we wanted to apply to, on land, but to do it in a way that would lower greenhouse gas emissions and not increase it. Mm -hmm. So what did you find from all of this, like, experimenting? Yeah, so let's see. Can we see it? So we've gone um, now and sampled a number of sites around California. We have two long-term study sites. One is in Marin County, mm -hmm. and um, one is in uh, Yuba County, the Sierra Foothills Research and Extension Center that UC runs. And at each of those sites, we, we applied a very thin layer of compost. You can see it with the tractor um, and what it looks like afterwards, just a, a half an inch, so just a dusting of compost on the surface. And we did it once in 2008. Mm -hmm. And then we sampled soils annually till 2013, the first five years, and then again in 2018, 10 years later. We also sampled the, the plants. Ugh. So what we found were red bars and blue bars. <laughs> the red bars are the compost amended sites and the blue bars are um, the controls, so they didn't receive anything. Mm -hmm. um, and the first five numbers that you see here are the first five years of the study. And then the last one is, it, uh, was 2018, that was year 10. And these bars are measuring or, or reporting the plant, the above ground plant production, oh. um, the grass growth, or what Lauren and others would call the forage production, mm -hmm. right? This is the important product that is coming out of this. And what you can see is in those first three years, there was a huge increase 
in forage production from that little thin layer of compost. Half an inch. Either. Half an inch, yeah, one time, 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it declined a little bit in all the sites, and that was those were our big drought years. Mm -hmm. The blue bars were still, um, uh, uh, sorry, the red bars were, were similar to or a little higher than the blue bars, but everything was suffering during the drought. Mm -hmm. And what was really surprising is that 2018 at year 10, we see it's, it's, we see that red bar still higher than the blue bar. Wow. So 10 years after we applied the compost, That's we amazing. saw this big effect. And then what's really cool is this green, these green bars, <laughs> which are showing the relative change in soil carbon. Mm -hmm. So wow. anything below the line, is, was soil carbon was, was greater in the control plots than in the treatment plots. And anything above the line means that soil carbon was greater in the, the compost plots, right? And um, each bar is, is a year, and so the first bar was the pretreatment, and it just so happened that you can't see the error bars there, but they overlap the zero line. Mm -hmm. So it just so happened that the, the, um, before we did anything to these lands, the control plots had a, a little bit more carbon than the, the treatment plots. After 10 years, and we have an army of undergrads in our lab that every soil sample, they sort out the compost fragments. So we're just measuring new wow. soil carbon. Um, you can see after 10 years, there's a lot of carbon. So we're increasing carbon uh, um, by about um, 0.7 to 1.2 metric tons of carbon per hectare per year, um, just from that one-time application. Was that surprising? Hugely <laughs> surprising. We really expected the, res the effect to go away. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is super cool. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting, and we're looking forward to, to, to sorry for the pun, but digging in deeper um, <laughs> to try to understand this better, um, to follow some other sites. We've now applied compost um, to sites all around the state of California mm -hmm. uh, in collaboration with the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service of the USDA. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we will, through the, the funding that we have, um, currently be able to do the first five years of that research and hopefully um, come back later and follow it more. That's super exciting. So what do you think are some of the uh, potential implications for that in agriculture all across California? Yeah, I think, I think that, um, um, I, I think the first thing that it's important to remember is that, again, these are, these are wasted materials. I like the idea of saying wasted as opposed to, you know, calling it waste. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot of nutrients and a lot of carbon and materials that we're throwing out. And we put it in landfills and slurry ponds and other places where it emits a lot of greenhouse gas. So the nice thing about doing this um, from a climate change perspective is, and from a, a soil health perspective is we're taking this nutrient and carbon in a place where it's not doing any good. It's not growing us more food. It's not improving livelihoods. Mm -hmm. It's not um, employing people. Um, and we're, we're transforming it through this cool biogeochemical process into this kind of black gold, right? Yeah. Except it's not oil, it's compost. <laughs> and you spread that out to lands, and um, we're seeing in improved growth, in in increased food production. Um, it works in, in croplands as well. My mm -hmm. colleagues at Davis are, have been testing this now in crops. It works quite well. And so I, I think there's tremendous potential um, at a at state scale to repurpose our waste streams into um, materials that can help lower greenhouse gas emissions and pull carbon out of the atmosphere through carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that this could be done at scale? And, if, and what sort of things or what sort of supports do you think that we need in place for that to happen? I, I definitely think it could be done at scale. Yeah. I mean, there are regions um, around the world where composting is a, is a normal, natural, everyday kind of activity. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting there here in Berkeley and in and surrounding communities that are that compost um, food waste and, and other waste. Um, it takes education. It takes all of you guys not putting plastic and other things in the compost bin because um, ranchers and farmers really don't want your garbage out on the landscape, mm -hmm. right? They, they just want the organic material. Mm -hmm. So it takes getting people to use their compost bins correctly to take everything that was once alive can go in a compost bin. So getting that, capturing that material, keeping it out of the landfills, keeping it out of the waste stream, and then 
uh, land applying it, uh, making it accessible, providing the, the equipment that are, that's needed, the education that's needed mm -hmm. to ha uh, help it work. Um, the state is, is way out in front of the science at this point, um, and so I do think that we're gonna see this uh, move forward. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so I hope that everyone has like a little bit more understanding of how the science behind soil carbon sequestration works. Um, now we're gonna bring up the farmers and rancher to talk about regenerative agriculture and what that looks like in practice. Thank you, Wendy. Sure. Yep, yeah, hold up. <laughs> um, Lauren, Kristen, you can sit over here, and Lauren, you can sit over here. You can sit wherever, yeah. <laughs> Neither one. <laughs> I'm really excited to have some of my favorite farmers and new favorite rancher um, <laughs> here. So <laughs> on my right, there's Lauren Poncha from Semple Creek Ranch, Moretta Brown from Berkeley Basket, and Kristen Leach from Namu Farm. And instead of reading off their bios, um, I would just like them to tell us a little bit about themselves and their, and their practices so we can see what it all looks like in practice. So let me just slide through these. Um, Lauren, if you'd like to... Oh, actually, wait, who's, who's first? Just kidding, oh. Moretta's first. <laughs> um, hey, y'all. Oh, my goodness. Um, my name is Mo Brown, um, Moretta Brown. I am a co-farmer slash manager of the Berkeley Basket CSA. My co-farmer is here tonight, Mariana. Um, you might recognize her from the photo. <laughs> um, my pronouns are they, she. And this project has been going on for... Uh, just about 11 years now. Um, I've only been participating in the CSA for about two seasons now. I'm going into my second season. Um, and this is just a photo of, I think this is actually one of our first harvests last year. Uh, our, and this was my first season. Look how happy I am. <laughs> um, so the photos might be a little bit out of order, and I've got a little bit of, just a tiny bit of time to tell you about this. So this is actually our new site. Um, we grow all of our food uh, in backyards in Berkeley, uh, specifically three. And this is our third site here now. Um, this was a work day that we had where our friends and people from the community came out to help us uh, dig trenches, and we are very grateful for that um, because I don't think anybody <laughs> would want to dig trenches on a Saturday. Uh, and so this here is actually where I live. I live at one of the sites here in Berkeley. Um, and this is part of our regenerative ag practices. So you'll see that the in-ground beds are covered with hay. Uh, this helps kind of retain water in the soil as well as uh, uh, lower the temperature of the soil. Um, this was a, just before a rain came down, so that also helps protect kind of the, um, when that rain hits the soil and we get that kind of, uh, uh, what's it called? When um, the rain hits the soil and the compaction. Woo, there we go. <laughs> that happens. Uh, so this was actually taken in November, December when we put down our cover crop, which is another regenerative ag practice that we use. Um, and we also included on top of the cover crop fava beans. Um, so this was the site before we actually started going to work. Uh, putting down those trenches. We do sheet mulching on top of wood chips to help suppress weeds. Um, let's see. And this is uh, the cover crop now. It's actually a little bit taller. Uh, this is at one of on another site, uh, our first site. Um, as you can see, the we do mulch the pathways as well. I love mulch. Talk to me afterwards about mulch. <laughs> um, but this is going to be a cover crop mix. So you see there's beans, vetch, grasses. Um, and I think we prefer the mix just because it provides kind of a total coverage, if you will, of uh, soil support. Um, here are my hands. Uh, I'm also a hand model on the side. Uh, this is a, a typical basket. We grow about 30 crops a season. Um, in addition to our regenerative ag practices, we also really do lean into community. Um, we have a community of farmers who often have bumper crops that we add into our basket to give to our families. Um, and so you'll see here, I won't go through all of it, but there's artichoke, chard, lemons, um, flowers that were donated, and also some that we grew 
uh, on, on site as well. We also kind of give folks a variety. We like to use nasturtium flowers. A lot of folks don't, haven't used flowers in salads and soups and things, so kind of hoping to expand the palette. So you have three different backyards that yes. you work out of, and how many people are you able to feed? Um, last season, we fed 13 families, and with the new site, hopefully we'll be feeding 20, 21. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. So then Kristen, okay. um, this is Kristen. Thank you, Mo. Thanks, And so. this is Kristen of Namu Farm, who's going to tell us about her, her farm. Uh, yeah, I have a vegetable farm up in Winters, California, and uh, it's in Yolo County. And YOLO is actually just the Pat one word for a type of grass that grows in that savanna ecosystem. It's not what you thought it was. I tried, I tried asking someone if they knew. I was like, do you know what YOLO actually means? And they're like, yeah, obviously we know. You only live once. And I was like, no. <laughs> I learned that from you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and I grow predominantly Korean and East Asian herbs and vegetables. Um, I partner with a restaurant in San Francisco and that's where the bulk of the produce goes to. And then I also do field trials for Kitazawa Seed Company, uh, which is right here in Oakland. Uh, it's a 103-year-old Asian variety um, seed company for vegetables and herbs. And um, I have a small seed line through that called Second Generation that's focused on not only preserving heirloom seeds, but on helping to preserve some of the stories and the, the culture that evolved with those seeds. I have two more pictures. Oh, this is my favorite place on the farm. <laughs> uh, this is just a picture to kind of show some of the on-farm breeding that we do in tandem with uh, UC Davis and Organic Seed Alliance. This is a project to breed a type of Korean summer squash. And then that is some of just our seed processing that happens in the fall, uh, just plants drying and being prepared to be processed. Thank you. And then now we have oh, the clicker. Thank you. So Lauren, can you tell us Perfect. a little bit about Simple Creek Ranch? Sure. So um, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Lauren Poncha with Stemple Creek Ranch. Our ranch is located not very far from here where that star is, up on uh, the northern tip of Tomales Bay. Some of you have probably been out there along the Point Reyes Peninsula. We're across the other side. And uh, I'm actually the fourth generation. This is actually a cool photo because that's uh, my great-grandfather in the top right corner. He immigrated from Garzano, Italy in 1897, and he headed straight to West Marin to raise food for San Francisco and the Bay Area. It's pretty wild how over 120 years ago, somebody knew, somebody from Garzano, Italy, knew that it was uh, an amazing place to come and raise food. Mm -hmm. And now I'm the fourth generation. We've been continually operating the ranch for about 120 20 years. And about 15 years ago, my wife and I kind of reinvented the business and came up with the name Stemple Creek Ranch. Started marketing direct to consumers, got the place certified organic. And um, let's see, I went the wrong way. No, I went the right way. Um, we... Um, I'm gonna, hit, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have time to look at these other slides after, right? Yeah, so we, um, we got the place certified organic. We started selling direct to consumers and now um, I had a day job as well. I actually worked for the devil on the human, or pardon me, on the uh, animal pharmaceutical side of the business. And I learned a lot about what I did not wanna do anymore. So mm -hmm. about five years ago, I quit my day job and doubled down and we're full time Stemple Creek Ranch, and you guys probably see our product on a lot of local menus and uh, butcher shops and uh, grocery stores. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we became involved in regenerative agriculture and carbon farming and how it's really changed our, our outlook on the future. And we're super stoked about what we do right now and, and uh, the future of agriculture and healthy food here locally. Thank you. So as we mentioned earlier, um, regenerative agriculture has been gaining a lot of mainstream attention. And it's like really exciting and rightly so because of its potential climate impacts. And I wanna say that this way of farming that is really in, like, in right relationship with land is not anything new. People have been practicing like, farming like this for ages all over the world. And so it's, I think it's really important to remember that not only is like farming not inherently bad, but, um, and the issue with farming is, the issue with farming is not farming itself, but with industrial agriculture. And one of the things that Real Food Media that we like to talk about as a solution to industrial agriculture is agroecology. 
Um, and so, Mo, you went to uh, CASFIS, or the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems in Santa Cruz. So can you tell us uh, what is agroecology? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to share. Uh, when Tiffany asked me to kind of define what agroecology is, I got a little nervous um, just because to, to kind of synthesize the idea of agroecology in just a minute or two seems a bit daunting. Um, so I also invite my uh, fellow guests up here as well to chime in at any point. But um, are folks familiar with Miguel Altieri at all? Okay, I see a few hands and snaps. Nice. Okay, so while I was at CASFIS, Miguel actually came down to the farm to talk to us about agroecology. And the one thing that stood out to me was that he described it as a global social political movement. Um, and I, that always stuck with me because my perception of agroecology specifically only existed in the farming techniques, in the things that people did to work the soil, to grow the food, um, to preserve the land. But agroecology seeks to build on that. We're going, um, in addition to the environmental and the farming aspects, you also have um, the overarching theme of decentralizing the food system and re, uh, re, re, um, na like re-navigating or re-empowering the people in those communities who are affected by those food systems, right? So that looks like fisher folk, that looks like peasant farmers, that looks like indigenous peoples, that looks like women, black and indigenous people of color around the world. Um, they are all practicing agroecology and this has been, um, a uh, food, a uh, food, a uh, farming technique or farming techniques that have, like Tiffany was saying, have been happening far, far before we were all on this planet and will continue to happen far after. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to provide an example for you all of a, of a group or a collective that is using agroecology to kind of shift the food system, and that is La Via Campesina. Um, and I wanted to say their name here today because they are organizing over 180 uh, collaboratives around the world um, behind the principles of agroecology. Um, yeah, so Thank you. I invite you to, do you want to sh add anything else? <laughs> <laughs> and how does, does, how does regenerative agriculture differ from agroecology or is it like housed within it or? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, so I like to think of agroecology as this like really big, beautiful umbrella, and under that umbrella is regenerative agriculture. Um, Dr. Wendy shared this beautiful presentation about the science of regenerative ag, and I like to think of regenerative agriculture and working with collaboration, but science at, is not the forefront of agroecology, right. um, because they're really, it's, it's all about the collective power for each of these things versus just one kind of leading the charge. Mm -hmm. So I would say definitely that regenerative aggressive agricultural practices are a part of agroecology, um, but is in collaboration with. Awesome, thank you. So agroecology is this broader like political movement. It's all about decentralizing power and regaining control over your local food system. And I feel like it also is this philosophy that really values relationships, like relationships with each other, relationships with people between the land. Um, and I wanted to hear from all of you, what are some of the things that you value and what values do you bring into your work and how do they drive your work? Anyone can go first. I mean, one, <laughs> one thing that pops to mind that's really easy is, um, is our direct connection with consumers. If that's the biggest value for us is we, we basically have an open door policy on our operation, but we also collaborate with lots of other farmers and ranchers around and educating people. And we want our consumers to be able to know and put a face with the products that we, we raise. And we want people to come to the ranch and educate themselves on the difference between grass finished beef and feedlot beef or, or lamb, pasture raised lamb or, um, you know, artisanal vegetables. Uh, and the best way to do that is to actually get feet on the ground and get out of the city and come to the ranch and get your hands in the soil and look at the worms and look at the compost and, and understand it and understand the whole carbon cycle and the life cycle. And really a lot of what we do is a dance with mother nature, all of us up here. It's a dance. We ref um, 
Uh, we referred to a dance earlier, mm -hmm. and it's really a dance every day. There's, there's not a textbook that says this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. It might be a guide, but every single year is different. And uh, so working with each other, especially knowing our consumers, is something that I love. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would say the same thing as Lauren, actually, that I think that the relationships are the most important thing to us as well on the farm. And I think just speaking as someone who, when I started the farm, um, you know, I'm sitting here in a business school and confessing to you all that I'm like a terrible business person. So I feel like <laughs> I snuck in here under the radar and I'm just going to, you know, feed your mind very bad generative <laughs> <laughs> thoughts. But... I didn't go into it because I thought that I was going to be a successful business person, I, and I just have more affinity for plants than I do other people. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I feel confident as a farmer, um, but the response and just kind of getting to connect with other Korean Americans and other Asian Americans, other folks of color doing this work, um, yeah, has just kind of emboldened my investment into it. And so I think that for me, um, the people who care the most about my farm, it's not even my closest loved ones or friends and family. Like, they all love me and love the farm, but it's definitely the community that's formed around it and the people that respond. And so I think for me, like, the idea of agroecology is, like, really an idea of placemaking, and it's not like what you saw earlier in that diagram, like this linear set of inputs and this industrial process that leads to food as a product, and we have transactions, and you're my customers, and I'm the producer, uh, but a much more rich, robust web of interactions. Mm -hmm. um, so as an anti-capitalist that gets to sit in a business school with a captive audience, I would just say, yeah, that I think that mostly it's focused on um, what emerges. And my viability is really linked to the fact that people genuinely care about the farm and the investment isn't just an investment of capital. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well? <laughs> oh, um, I would also just say ditto to uh, what was shared and I um, also wanted to uplift that uh, something that we bring into the Berkeley Basket CSA is just um, our conversation around queer ecology and looking at our natural world. And, and, and usually when you, we look at plants, when we look at our relationship to plants and to non-humans, it's all very um, hierarchical. Humans are at the top and everything else falls underneath that. Mm -hmm. And something that we think about and try to practice in some sort of way is understanding that we are working with nature and that kind of breaks down um, that kind of hierarchical or um, language that we use when we're talking about nature, when we're talking about non-human animals in our space. Mm -hmm. um, and often the actions we take to remove those non-human animals and plants that we don't want there. Um, and so, and I use the term queer ecology because as a black queer farmer, um, I hold so many identities in my work. And uh, use, looking at nature in its full spectrum, mm -hmm. that nature is very queer. Um, and, and oftentimes science is used to eradicate that and tell us that we are unnatural. And in reality, um, farming, gardening, ranching, just being out in nature is, is, is a beautiful thing. And we want to be able to um, acknowledge that there are a lot of behaviors beyond just kind of the um, standard heteronormative uh, behaviors that are taught to us. So that is something that we try to bring in, in in our relationships with people who come to the farm is take a moment and look at how everything is working together. So. Nice, thank you. So I'm hearing a lot, obviously around relationships and then also looking at things not from a hierarch hierarchical relationship, but um, looking at it as in we're all like interconnected in this web and like equal. Um, and there's just something for, and I know from both of you is that there's this way that you both are farming now that really relied on that strength of relationship and community. So one of the ways, or one of the many challenges that farmers face, that new farmers face is getting land. Um, and both of you have been able to work on land in a way that I think is really interesting and speaks to the strength of your relationships. So can you tell us a little bit about that, about how you got land? <laughs> um, I originally leased or I subleased land from a tomato breeder that I worked for. 
Um, and I was just trying to do like a little side hustle growing these vegetables and bringing them into a Namu restaurant in San Francisco. Um, and then it just sort of evolved from there. And I ended up being introduced to uh, an older farmer who grows predominantly olives for olive oil up in Yolo County. And he brought me in as part of his succession plan, essentially. So as he's stepping back and gradually retiring, um, which may take forever because he has so much energy and he's such a hard worker and he kind of lives to work still. Um, but I'm there on two acres within his 20, but gradually starting to take on management of, of more land as he steps mm -hmm. back. So. That's okay. awesome. Well. <laughs> um, so I will share a very brief anecdote. I came out of Caspis in 2017, moved up to Oakland. Um, and I told myself at that point that by 30, I wanted to be managing a farm. Um, and I think Caspis really set me up with the technical skills, uh, with the language to talk about how I wanted to farm. Um, but coming out of Caspis and just with the subsequent um, journey I took, I had no money. <laughs> I was pretty broke. Uh, and it, it was taught to me that you needed some sort of capital to be able to start a farm. Um, and so fast forward two years, I'm now 30 and I'm managing a farm. Um, <laughs> Co-managing. Um, and I'm able to do that because of the community. Uh, the way the Berkeley Basket is set up, we have at each of our sites, through the generosity of our homeowners um, who've opened up their space to us, uh, it all rests on the vision. They were talking about visioning earlier. Um, we have conversations and meetings with them asking, what is it that you want to, how do you want to support your community? And they all unanimously say, well, we want to grow food. We want to be able to feed our community. Um, and we're like, well, great. Uh, we're able to do that because we have the skills and you have the land, so let's, let's meet in the middle here. Um, and so that's kind of how I was able to, I don't have any money to purchase land, but I do know people who have land in the city um, who, who share the same vision of being able to feed our communities. Um, so yeah. Thanks. It's such an innovative way, I think, of, like, of managing a farm is to do it in people's backyards. And there was um, local policy that supported that effort as well. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a, the Berkeley Basket was born out of the Edible Gardens le Legislature that passed in 2012, I believe. Um, and Berkeley Basket was actually started by Council Member Sophie Hahn and Willow Rosenthal, who you might be familiar with, uh, City Slicker Farms. Uh, and they started it in 2009. In 2012, they were able to help change the Berkeley Municipal Code so that folks like you and me can actually uh, make a little money off selling food out of our homes. And this is non-processed food, so vegetables, fruit, nuts, honey. Um, and so the Berkeley Basket CSA was supposed to be a project that could uh, inspire people like you all in this room right now. What could we do when we actually knock on our neighbor's door and say, hey, you've got some fruit trees and I've got some bed space. Like, can we put together a little basket for people on our street to, to enjoy once a week? Um, and so, yeah, it was definitely because of the Edible Gardens legislature that we were able to do this as well. So Lauren, as a fourth generation rancher, you didn't have like quite the same challenge of acquiring land, but you did face another significant challenge, which I feel like was a narrative challenge. Right now, everyone, a lot of people are adopting plant-based diets because there's this, there's a narrative that beef is bad and like industrialized beef is bad for the planet, but not all beef is bad. And um, could you tell us a little bit about your ranching practices and its climate impacts and why yours is better. Sure. Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is a good topic. And, and, I, and full disclosure, it wasn't just super easy for me to come home and this land was there either. I mm -hmm. rent tons of land and mm -hmm. every single day on my, on my, uh, in our business, I'm trying to figure out where to get more land. Mm -hmm. And to see you guys do what you do is awesome. And I invite anybody that's out there in the audience that wants to do what these, these awesome ladies have done that come and talk to people like me because I want to diversify our operation and have more Ooh. different types of enterprises on our land, but I want it to be done with a business plan and I want a, 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 um, it to be sustainable and regenerative. But I would love to follow like Gabe Brown's footsteps who is a rancher in North Dakota 
who he doesn't need a lot more land. He just needs, uh, he just keeps layering on enterprises. And like right now, we already have uh, bees, honey, um, uh, pork, beef, and lamb. I skirted your question, but I'm not skirting your question. <laughs> I love to talk about fake meat and beef. And, <laughs> and um, so where we're at right now is uh, we have more and more consumers on a daily basis that want to know what we're doing, and our sales have never been better. So in the face of plant-based uh, proteins um, or plant-based meats, as some people would call them, um, our sales are strong and growing. And w I'm frankly not very worried about uh, those alternative meats because they're more, most of them are, are pretty much like fast food. If you look at the ingredient list, go and have a, a Impossible Burger and there's 10 to 13 different things on the, on the, uh, on the uh, actual ingredient list. And if you want to have a Stemple Creek Burger, there's one ingredient and it's regenerative. Um, it's regeneratively grown and we're actually sequestering more carbon and we have data to show it. And Wendy's part of that, so it's it's really awesome. How long can I talk? Because I'll talk, <laughs> I will talk for a long time if you let me. Like a minute. For okay, so are about you going to come back to me and show you some of the stuff we're well, doing? Well, this is this was the this, this is, is the it. Part. Okay, yeah. I'm going to blast through these slides because I want to show you some of the stuff we're doing because this is really really cool stuff, and I can show you it in person too. But so this is uh, the front window of my parents' house that I grew up in, looking down at the creek when I was about five years old. And you can see, it's basically desertified. You can see the water, there's no trees, the cows are grazing right next to the creek. This is it now, today. This is regenerative wow. agriculture. So this is before we were paying attention, this is regenerative agriculture now. There's That's 35 amazing. types of migratory birds that nest in this creek. The water's clear. I mean, it's perfect, beautiful beaver habitat, but no beavers have shown up yet. But it will happen. <laughs> It will happen. So here's 1990, 2010, where we started paying attention, and 2018. I'm following my father's footsteps, who really started fencing the riparian areas, planting trees, and keeping the cattle out of there. We have five solar pumps that pump water to move the cattle around to different pastures. This is what our riparian areas look like now, full of life, beaming with life. And we just graze oh, them. You can go past on, that picture, sorry. Can I go past that Go picture? past that one, yeah. Okay, we just graze them. <laughs> Um, but basically, every single day, our holistic goals are to build more soil on our ranch. And uh, by, by building more soil and putting more carbon in the soil, uh, it allows for our soil to act like a sponge. And since we're in a Mediterranean climate, we only get rain half the year. And we want to store all of that water in the soil so that we can grow perennial plants and they can photosynthesize with tap roots, photosynthesize year round, and basically, um, sequester carbon year-round because we're photosynthesis farmers ultimately and I use these beasts try and mimic what's going on with mother nature across the Great Plains three or four hundred years ago with bison they'd eat the grass in front of them stomp on the grass below them poop on the grass behind them and it would regenerate the soil build soil massive roots massive organic matter and so if you ask ourselves um, is carbon farming planning working on our ranch? You can see the pasture on the left-hand side is green, but it's not lush and green like the pasture on the right-hand side. So we're growing about five times the amount of biomass on the right-hand side of the fence wow. than my neighbor is on the left-hand side of the fence. And what's happening is as people like us are being more and more successful, our neighbors are starting to pile on. So now there's 30 carbon farm plants in the, in the uh, county, not one. Nice. So, so we're really excited about that. And see, that's we actually do two tours. We want people to come and visit us. So, <laughs> I could talk for five more minutes. But, uh, thank you so I much. I wish you had so much more time. I would yeah, love right. to hear. <laughs> um, okay, so we've heard a lot about soil and land management, and I feel like that's another part of resilient or of yeah of regenerative agriculture that we haven't touched on yet, which is seeds. And so, Kristen, could you tell us a little bit about about seeds and why they're so important to building um, a like a beautiful, resilient ecosystem. And I suppose I have one minute to just sit <laughs> down. <laughs> one thing I can talk about, Tiffany. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that seed oftentimes uh, is this somewhat overlooked or invisible uh, component of sort of the architecture of our food systems, especially when we talk about regenerative food. Um, but 
but it really is kind of the keystone of that system because it really affects everything uh, from a management perspective. And so I think if you look at the example of the Green Revolution and the shortcomings of that and in design what it was meant to do was to really dismantle these old sustainable forms of agriculture around the globe uh, in return for uh, you know, several years of a higher yielding crop. Um, if we apply that logic to a regenerative frame, it's actually quite promising to think about what's possible in a very short period of time. If we have seeds that are better capable of thriving and being adaptive and reflexive in the face of climate chaos. Um, and it's again, like you said, there's all these buzzwords and these kind of zeitgeist moments right now, but really that biodiversity is completely stewarded by mm -hmm. uh, you know, farmers predominantly in the global south. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they are preserving over 80% of the biodiversity that exists still in the face of the kind of staggering loss that we've seen because of this industry consolidation. Um, and so I think that some of the things that we do are to work with not only heirloom crop preservation, but to really talk about the role that farmers have to play in our seed systems um, and that that preservation work should really be led uh, by farmers. Um, because the intelligence of a seed is that each year, you know, like annual crops get a really bad rap, I think, in a lot of these discussions. Um, but when I look at, you know, the overall ecosystem where I live in Yolo County, and a lot of it has gone to walnuts historically, it used to be processing tomatoes, and now more and more it's almonds because of drought in San Joaquin Valley. Um, so you have these tree crops that are migrating and are gonna to continue to migrate north as we experience more extreme weather patterns, uh, more extreme temperature days per year. Um, and that is like a big thing economically and it is a big thing ecologically. But annual crops, like every single year you grow them and when you grow them in this responsible way, they're banking that knowledge, they're cataloging that information of what they've seen, what that season was like. And I think to just contrast kind of the more industrial biotech side of breeding, which usually wants to hone in and find like single or dual traits that are responsible for um, behaviors that are responsive to the outcomes we wanna see and are just fairly limited. Uh, On-farm seed breeding just means that you're having seed that is really directly attuned to your farming system and to your region and can be shareable. So again, it's from this agroecological perspective, it's important not just genetically, because if you look at someone like uh, Bayer, you know, Monsanto, all of the big guys are working on drought resistant corn, for example, right? Maize is extremely important as a commodity and their approach to drought resistance in corn, for example, is they found two genetic sequences that control RNA transfer during periods of drought and they are able to alter that sequence, right? So it alters that gene and that genetic code is in all of the progeny that they're breeding. Uh, and you contrast that with something like a Hopi farming system that is dry farmed for centuries with respect to place. And there are all these beans and corn that are extremely drought tolerant that are grown with no additional water um, and just much more resilient that if there is water in one year or there is something unpredictable and if this chaos is not linear. Um, so just to kind of contrast those two paradigms and to say that one is much more intelligent and it's slower and the knowledge that's gained mm -hmm. uh, is not just focused on like one pure utilitarian point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of say the other part of what we think is important is that that biodiversity existed in the first place because of the you know, robust cultural di diversity that evolved around the world. So a lot of these plants evolved with food cultures and you know, all of these different regions and preferences and tastes. And I think that our logic right now with the gene banking that we're doing, whether through Svalbard, like these doomsday vaults, even the USDA germplasm repository, we're storing them in case something goes wrong, but for a lot of people, things are going terribly wrong every day. And climate change isn't an existential threat to many people living on the globe right now, right? Mm -hmm. It's like extremely violent in this moment. Um, so I think that sort of uh, XC2 conservation makes no sense and that a lot of that germplasm really does have to be kind of returned to the, to the commons again. That's my rant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so 
for our final question, um, I'm just curious, as large-scale operations are taking on regenerative agriculture, what do you think that means for the food movement? And also just for our food system, but yeah, both. I think it becomes more vital for you guys and, and consumers to vote with their dollar, but to know, know their farmers and know their food, where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And um, as these <clears throat> niche type products uh, develop, like grass-fed beef you know, 15 years ago wasn't very common, and now it's all over the place. But the big, big companies like Cargill and IBP and you know, all these guys are getting into it. And it's you know, greenwashed quite a bit. A lot of it comes from other countries or travels 6,000 miles before it shows up on your grocery store shelf. So know, get educated, know where your food's coming from mm -hmm. is my biggest take on that. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen or Mo? <laughs> Uh, I would just yeah echo Mo's points earlier that you know climate change is not just this about the environmental impacts it's about the social impacts as well uh, and like Lauren is saying like yeah we're in a time where people are trying to capitalize on it it's not necessarily for the best reasons and you can question like if the end or the motivation justifies you know like the fact that they're still shifting even if it's for you know essentially just profit. Um, but yeah, to just question like who has maintained these farming systems, who holds that knowledge, who is facing like a state repression and violence and whose ability to have food linked to their self-determination is impacted by corporations coming into this realm. Mm -hmm. uh, and to look at that, like dwindling land access and who's impacted, so. Nice, thank you. <laughs> I think they covered it. <laughs> <laughs> so like when we're thinking about regenerative agriculture and as these large scale operations are taking it on, I think that it's like, I wonder, like, is it, is it regenerative if you're not like redistributing resources and opportunities and power? And if not, then we have to do like what, what you suggested is like really get to know where we're getting our things from um, and like vote with our vote, vote with our dollars, get really engaged and like really build on that, on the relational aspect of our lives. So, okay, so now we're gonna open it up for Q&A. So if anyone has some questions, I believe you, there's some mics set up. And also there's Q&A for people who are watching the live stream right now so you can type in your questions and someone will speak them for you. Um, so any, any questions? Okay. There was one question um, from online. Thank you. Um, and it was like very much to your point of just the best way for mindful eaters to vote with our forks and support regenerative agriculture with our daily food choices. If you guys had any advice there. Do you mind repeating the question? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just what's the best way for us as eaters to vote with our forks and support regenerative agriculture with our daily food choices? Okay. Thank you. Do y'all have? Drink milk from a glass bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Buy meat wrapped in paper. Mm -hmm. Know your farmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, vegetables are plant-based foods. Remember that. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just double emphasis on know your farmer. Um, I think always... I, Kristen, you hit the nail on the head just now, so I don't want to repeat anything, but um, we were having this conversation in the car earlier about sometimes folks get uh, a little nervous about price points around vegetables and food, uh, and we just want to gently invite you all to think about the true cost of food mm -hmm. when it comes to just beyond, um, when it shows up in the supermarket or at the farmer's market, but think about the people growing the food, think about the people who transport that food, their livelihood, think about all the practices that they put into growing that food. Um, yeah, we just gently invite you to ask yourself more questions about that. And I just want to point out that we're also very privileged to live in a place with so much access to so many amazing farmers. And for people who maybe like don't live in a place like the Bay Area or in um, any of like the bigger cities, 
we have to think, like, if we do have the privilege again to vote, then we have to think about like how we're voting and how we can support people in rural communities getting the things that they want. Um, yeah, any other questions? I feel like you have a question. <laughs> too short. <laughs> Hi, um, so I have a question about like, actually the power narratives for making positive changes in the food system. So I have the question for every one of you, like how do you think narratives and storytelling have played a positive role in the success of your operations and also in how you're able to make an make a larger impact. Um, Cause like also wanted to say that, um, and I'm trying to harness the power narratives to persuade my Chinese roommates who are mindful eaters, but who don't know anything about these like sustainable food systems concepts due to like their educational background. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So how has narrative and storytelling helped you in your business and just like spread the word and to grow? It's been huge for me. Our whole, our whole brand is our story. You know, just laying it out there and being honest, transparent, having a quality product and authentic. And authenticity is the biggest thing right now that like I, all the brands that we support are authentic brands that we can actually see everything, there's no hiding anything. Whether it's good or bad, my practices are good or bad, I want my consumers to be able to know um, and vote with their dollars. So the story's huge. We try and tell our story all the time and about how what we're doing is good for the environment. And it's a dance with Mother Nature. And every once in a while, we step on each other's toes, but we try not to do it over and over. You, you end up getting a new dance partner really quickly if you keep stepping on each other's toes. And that's me and Mother Nature, yeah. So. I mean, I think you're right that narrative is this kind of like really potent sort of driver in all of this and how we think about change. And I think um, I'm thinking more just about like some of the plant narratives and the stories and how they intersect with like our own histories. And I think that there's like just the geekiness around it. Like sometimes it's really helpful. Like I think of, um, you know, uh, amaranthus as a species, amaranth. Um, you know, it was such a, it's an essential food crop for most people in the world, right? On every continent, not Antarctica. Um, but, you know, when the Spanish colonized the Americas, uh, especially in the Aztec portion of that empire, uh, they banned the cultivation of amaranth because they saw it as ceremonial, they saw it as like, this plant was like not just this important nutritious food crop, but it was like a spiritual sort of kin to the people. Uh, so they burned fields, people were killed for having an association with it. And the really devastating thing is now, the first time that I met that plant as a farmer, you know, 15 years ago, I asked what it was and it's called pigweed on mm. farms, right? So maybe you've all seen it and pointed out to you as pigweed. Uh, so even just thinking about like this weird language that we're using in the story of perpetuating this. And then I backtrack and you look at amaranth and not only is it just like you eat the seeds, you eat the leaves, it's extremely nutritious, as, as nutritious as any type of like popular kale or something. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also one of the few C4 plants that are not monocots, right? Mm -hmm. So non-grass family C4 plants, which are sequestering carbon at a much higher rate than other types of broadleaf plants. So you have this crop that's doing all of these things and is kind of like has this character that is like so noble and yet at the same time, like we're inventing new ways by the moment to annihilate it. And it's one of the crops that when we look at biotechnology developing, like using CRISPR, uh, it's mainly designed to target amaranth because amaranth is such a prolific weed for uh, big commodity growers. So this is probably tangential to you, but I think that that's part of the thing. Every story, there's like a million other stories nested within it, and at the heart of all of those stories is the way we interact with these places. Uh, and I think that you can hear one story, 
the very popular story that gets a lot of coverage and is bright and shiny and new, uh, but we should be really stoking that curiosity about like what are the other stories present at, at any given moment. Thank you. That's, um, that's so awesome. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> Actually, Wendy, would you join us up here, please? Thank you. Sorry that's so awesome. That. I was just going to say the stories that we tell ourselves is something that you didn't really bring up, but growing up in agriculture, we tell ourselves stories that you know, pigweed is bad. Well, is it really? Or did somebody, some pharmaceutical company, decide somewhere that they were going to sell you a seed that you can spray something over the top of to kill the pigweed so that seed grows more? Like, it's just silly. You have to challenge yourself and challenge every single story about what's really good and what's not. And Wendy, I imagine storytelling and narrative um, plays a huge role in your work because not everyone is going to relate to graphs and the different bars and all the data. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, one of the things that I've been learning over the last, you know, 10 or 12 years is that, I, you know, as a scientist, I have to learn how to communicate um, and um, talk about our research in ways that people can understand it. And it, there's nothing, everybody can understand science. It's just that, that scientists speak a different language sometimes. And so, yeah, it's, it's a lot about learning how to tell a story and, um, and, and just remember to speak the same language that everybody else is instead of being off in our closet um, <laughs> speaking our secret language. Awesome, yeah. thank you. And then a question from up here? Yeah. You mentioned the idea of location contributing to access to these types of foods. So how would somewhere less fertile in the country, like the Northeast, be able to apply this know your farmer um, kind of idea? Is that a question? <laughs> um, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think, again, like it is definitely a privilege for us that we are able to do that. and so. As someone who's only been, lived here, I wouldn't be able to say like firsthand this is how it would be done, but I think it would be again just making sure that those who live in more privileged er areas like practice solidarity with those who do not and just really make sure to support them in whatever policies and things that they want to happen. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you said Northeast specifically, correct? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of, there's the group, the National Young Farmers Coalition. They're based in New York, and I feel like a lot of their chapters are represented in the Northeast. Um, and a lot of their work is sharing young farmer narratives about just like, what does it take to get into farming as a young farmer? They use young farmer not just in age, but in experience as well. Um, and that's a, honestly a really good place to start. I've done a little bit of like collaborative work with them. Um, but again, as a place that I feel like the Northeast, my perception is that there's winter and then it's hot and then it's a lot of snow again. <laughs> so um, they're obviously their locale, their food system is a little different than ours. Um, but they would be just like an anchor point to kind of connect with other people um, and like, yeah, who's who's growing my food in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then you had a question. I have a question about uh, soil sequestra sequestration and ranching. So for like uh, Stemples Creek Ranch, does your ranch like sequester more carbon than your cows produce methane? Because I just, I'm not sure whether it's like a bigger impact for me to not eat like meat, like eat plant-based diet, or like just focus more on where my food is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. That's a really good question. And uh, so far from the initial data that we have on our ranch, and we're still gathering it, we sequester about 2,000 pounds of carbon per hectare per year, and um, it shows that we're net positive. So we're actually sequestering um, about two pounds of carbon per pound of meat that we raise, but it's not, that's not the case in all agriculture. And honestly, that data is a little squishy right now. So um, you know, w when you look at carbon farming and you look at the CO2, life cycle and plants being grown. I mean, a cow will eat the, the plant, which is made of carbon, and it'll basically recycle it back into the atmosphere. It's a big cycle of life. And, you know, there was literally millions and millions and millions of mammals here on this planet hundreds of years ago. And it's, there's not a 
humong uh, vast difference than now. Um, and the, the land that our cattle are grazing on is not tillable land. It's not, there's not anything else you can do. And by grazing correctly, which there's a lot of not correct grazing, including me, sometimes I'm not perfect at it. Um, by grazing correctly, we're actually increasing the amount of biomass in the soil and pulling more CO2 from the atmosphere and actually building the soil. So the jury's still out. It depends on who, who you're talking to, and it depends on the data set, and it depends on the current management. But I would definitely steer away from feedlot beef or confinement uh, animal um, proteins. And I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yeah. And then Wendy? Yeah, so um, we did do some life cycle assessments where we tried to follow the carbon all the way through and the, the whole greenhouse gas budget all the way through from beginning to end. Um, with very, some very discrete lines, like we didn't, we didn't have to build landfills in our model and we didn't have to build the equipment like tractors in our model. Um, but it shows that given the current stocking densities of, of cattle on um, rangelands, especially in the area that Lauren's working in and, and this part of California, um, you can definitely sequester more carbon than you emit greenhouse gas. The real key comes in the herd size and how you manage that herd. Mm -hmm. So if you're grass feeding your cows and it's sustainable and you're not needing to bring in tons and tons of outside feed so that you get those beautiful green pastures and you can, you know, you don't have to supplement too much with outside feed, then, then you definitely can be a net sink for atmospheric CO2. If you start growing more of that grass, and then you go and buy a whole bunch more cows, and you bring those out onto the land, and then you don't quite have enough grass to go around, so you have to start buying outside feed and corn and things like that that are very greenhouse gas intensive, then it doesn't work. So the interesting thing is when we first started learning about this, we went and, and interviewed uh, ranchers in California and in Colorado through a collaborative project with the Colorado State University, and um, we found that not a single one of the ranchers that we talked to, and this was a random set of ranchers that were selected for us, said that if, if they were able to grow more grass, that they would increase the herd size. They all said, no, we would much prefer to get paid more, have le less expense of buying outside feed, and get paid more for growing grass-fed meat mm -hmm. than increasing the number of cows that we have to manage on the land. Um, and to your point, too, about like sometimes it's posed as like eat meat or don't uh, or plant-based diet just inherently being better. And I think that kind of, you know, Lauren set it up and I'm going to slam impossible foods, too. But just to say <laughs> that, you know, the reality is, is that the problem of like methane and the greenhouse gases isn't just about like the metabolism of a cow, right. right? It's about like all these other industrial processes upstream that get us like even an overly processed plant food, mm -hmm. plant-based food product, you know, like all the plastic that it's packaged in or all of, you know, the commodity crops that are then processed in a factory. Like, and so it's just to add, like there's just a little bit more fuzzy math that gets used in like pitching these like kind of newfangled ideas. And I do think like plant-centered diet is great. You know, I grow vegetables and I love vegetables, but it's like eat beans, you know, like mm -hmm. that's great. Like eat beans from your local farmer, uh, eat, you know, delicious beef from Lauren, um, as opposed to like thinking about like, yeah, that shiny new thing that is being a little dishonest in terms of just like blaming purely like an animal for methane production and not the processes that it's entrenched in. Mm -hmm. I look at that whole thing as kind of a, yeah, so awesome. <laughs> I look at the whole uh, impossible food similar to like, <laughs> how many of you guys are, how old are you guys in this, in this class? But like, <laughs> when I was a young child, my mom thought margarine was good. And now, you know, there was a big trend like, oh, margarine is good. And astronauts were drinking Tang. Like, oh, Tang is good for you. Mm -hmm. And now, yeah, like, this is 10 years from now, we're going to be looking back going, remember people said impossible was better than, like, the real thing? It's like, don't get confused with the facts and just do what you think is right and know your farmer. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Thank you. Yeah, everything's a lot more nuanced than it's um, like projected to be. And so I think it really 
for us to be like responsible eaters and just people in the world, we have to dig a little deeper than what was just presented to us on like packaging. Um, there was a question up here. Thank you. Yeah, I had two quick things. The first was, uh, I actually used to live in New England and my family was subscribed to a CSA. And yes, it did close during the winter because you can't grow anything with two feet of snow. <laughs> um, and the second thing is, you guys have sort of described uh, agroecology as a socio-political movement, but I haven't heard too much about like what political legislation or political aims that you guys have being mirrored in, I don't know, the current uh, dialogue, especially with the recent uh, caucuses. Um, so I was wondering, uh, particularly with emphasis on voting with your dollar and voting with your vote in this class, uh, what legislation or what goals do you guys see for agroecology and regenerative agriculture in general? Thank you. I can hit on a very small part of that. Um, and that is that there is a lot of support and we're gaining momentum in the state of California with healthy soil and soil. And there's actually a um, California funded healthy soils initiative that actually helps ranchers, farmers like us up here um, implement practices that we can't afford to do on our own to help sequester more carbon. And it's like a $25 million, but I'm gonna probably get the number wrong, but it's like $25 million of the state's fund to help people like me apply compost, reseed the pastures, um, plant riparian areas, add waters to make more clean water, decrease erosion. And they're great, great programs and they're legislative based. So I would encourage you um, to educate yourself on those and to talk to your local legislators and tell them you support healthy soil uh, because those programs need to really grow to be able to get the majority of the farmers in the state to um, adopt them. Wendy might know the answer, but uh, I can't recite it, so I'm gonna put you on the hot seat here. <laughs> but it's, <clears throat> how many acres in California, if we applied compost to them, we would sequester how many six million passenger vehicles worth of? Yeah, it's, it's, why do I have these numbers in my head? <laughs> so there's, there's 20 mil, 23 million hectares of rangeland in California. If we could sequester, if we took um, half of that land and said that's what we're going to work with and the other half of the people don't want to play and we sequester one metric ton of carbon per hectare per year which is about what we're doing and, and probably a little less than what what um, Lauren's doing we could offset the uh, the um, commercial and residential energy sector in California Wow! just I mean that's huge that's huge <laughs> right. thank you um, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I did also want to add a little bit of legislation, um, but this is more so regenerative in that we are um, opening up the, the healthy soils and I think I believe it's called sweep as well, opening up the pool of candidates for that. That's part of this legislation, but the Farmer Equity Act of 2017, um, I share that with because part of that legislation was or is um, providing access or giving access to resources for um, quote unquote socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. And in the code, it's labeled as uh, farmers of color, women and veteran farmers. Um, and so there is at the CDFA, uh, a new position that was made out of that Farmer Equity Act. That person's name is Thea Rittenhouse and she's there in the CDFA to help uh, farmers of color, women farmers, and veteran farmers to have access to healthy soils and sweep these regenerative ag policy, uh, programs. So, um, yeah, Thea Rittenhouse, Farmer Equity Act, 2017. <laughs> <laughs> Just some hot buttons. Thank you. So I think we have time for one quick question. Um, yeah. Um, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you to all three of you for coming. I know. It's really busy to be a farmer, so thank you for telling, coming here and telling us your story. Um, my question kind of centers around the fact that a lot of farmers and ranchers around the country are quite poor and going broke, to be honest. Um, a lot of dairy farmers are going broke. Um, a lot of farmers, especially in the Midwest, are having to sell their land because they can't afford to farm the land. And so I guess I wanted to ask, um, 
how have you guys found it successful to tend to the land and be stewards of the land while still um, following regenerative practices? Is it direct to consumer? Is it CSA model? Is it direct to restaurant? Um, and I think that's kind of important to kind of talk about, especially since things are not gonna get more predictable. We're gonna have water issues. We're gonna have like wildfires. So I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about that. <laughs> I mean, commodity type uh, farming or ranching is going to be a really, really, really tough one because it's basically scale ability and somebody else can always do it cheaper than what we can do it. So when I first came home to the ranch and tried to make it a business 15 years ago, <clears throat> my whole goal was to sell three or four loads of conventional beef to the highest bidder for maybe five or 10 cents a pound more than the market and hopefully make a living. And I very quickly realized that when we did that, you know, 30% of them got sick when they went wherever they went and that didn't feel good to me. But at the same time, it was, it was not even keeping up with inflation. And being a price taker in my business was never going to be able to work for us. Like we have to figure out, we, have, we know what our costs are. We have to be, be able to figure out a way to actually charge a premium for it and make it a unique product so people like you will vote with your dollars and, and support it. And it pains me to watch the, the farmers um, going away in the Midwest. And, and frankly, it's happened here already. Um, you know, when I was a young child, there was 380 dairies in Marin County. Now there's like 24, you know, and there's still about the same amount of cows because they've all basically, now there's 24 bigger dairies and, you know, there's a whole bunch of little dairies gone. So, I mean, what we do, it's really hard, at least what I do, it's really hard to be able to make a living unless we have control over our, uh, our end product and what we charge for it. And we have willing consumers that are willing to pay for, for that. So that's the single biggest thing that's keeping us in business. And frankly, California is not a super business friendly state for a lot of reasons, but I'm blessed to be here in the Bay Area where we have affluent uh, consumers and those that aren't as affluent but very well educated that want to buy good products. So instead of buying, you know, instead of eating a pound of beef a day for a family of four, they might eat a pound of beef a week but have it be high quality beef, you know, and that's probably better anyway, be more plant forward on the dinner plate and not a 32 ounce ribeye in the center of the steak like you'll get in Missouri. You know, so I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, that's from my perspective. Do y'all have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that first, I don't feel like it's necessarily that I am doing something right that those farmers are not. Like I think mm -hmm. that those, uh, at that scale, what Lauren said is completely true that it's more a outcome because of all these predatory mechanisms, right? And it's like really about the game, not the players. Um, and so I think as you look at like, yeah, that consolidation is one reason why there's dwindling amounts of farms because it's just kind of, you know, the center eclipsing the margins. Um, it's to question like, we do need more of a systems lift too. And I think your question about policy is, is a good one because I think it's good for us to all act as agents in our own rights, but there needs to be something bigger to happen if we're gonna expect like a shift that uh, gives people opportunities to farm in this regenerative way, right? Like, so last year was super wet, cold spring. All my neighbors lost their early succession of canning tomatoes. They lost that window, right? Because the fields were under like, you know, two feet of water. Just because the fields are left bare through the winter, they're stale, so tomatoes can go in in February. And they couldn't do that. So that's like a huge thing lost in their calendar. Uh, but all of that comes from the top down. The cannery's telling you how much you get at the gate, and that's coming from like the other processors and the marketplace. Um, so I think we have to think about like that whole bigger ecosystem 
uh, when we think of it, because for me, it's like I contrast that with my fields where it's like we didn't see flooding, right? We had cover crop growing, all of that water was able to be like actually properly uh, percolating through the soil, it's returned into the aquifer, there's proper recharge. Um, but what are the barriers, right? It's not that people don't know, it's not that farmers are stupid or evil or nefarious, it's that the system is like presenting them with like a lot of barriers to that. And the margins are so razor thin. So I do think that that's like, I don't have the brain to think about what that looks like systems wide. Um, but just to say that, you know, I'm like one weird little business that's managing to stay like partially successful to keep one person with somewhat of a livelihood, you know, like, <laughs> um, but I'm able to do that because in some ways of just a number of factors that yeah, a bigger scale soy farmer in the driftless plain doesn't have, so. Um, I think this may answer your question, but I'm feeling like it's, I think all of our models are gonna be the answer to it, the diversification of how we approach this, this um, impending climate change, so to speak, because obviously my urban farm CSA may not apply or may not work in the Midwest, right? But you know, there are different models that are present here that I think could definitely address that. I don't think it's a one, one size fits all, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, I think we are all trying to figure out that, <laughs> what, it, what will make it viable. And I think the answer is like showing up in, in different ways to try and tackle that, that question, so. Great answer, thank you. So I think that's all the time that we have left for Q&A, unfortunately. Um, I just wanna thank you all, thank you for the questions, they were great, but thank you so much to all of you for joining us. <laughs> and just real quick, um, if, actually I think that's, that's it, yeah. <laughs> oh, right, sorry. And then we're gonna do next week's attendance. So thank you so much for other people who joined us on YouTube. We're signing off now. <laughs>Oh, and then really quickly, next week is going to be Civil Eats, Food in the Media. So I hope that everyone will come. It's going to be a great conversation. Okay, okay we're going to do attendance.